today is Ms. Christine Goldborn. She's the Director of Programs, uh, Family Network and Disabilities. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about Christine, uh, she's been an active member of the disability community for over 10 years. She's a parent of a child severely affected by autism and considers it a privilege to be able to serve as an advocate for families, their children, and individuals with disabilities. She's a board member of the Autism Society of Florida and the Florida Association for Positive Behavior Support. She's a member of the Florida NCLB Committee of Practitioners and of several school advisory committees and various support groups throughout Florida. As the Director of Programs for Family Network on Disabilities, Christine provides technical assistance and training for families, self-advocates, educators, and professionals on special education processes and best practices for increasing student achievement with effective parental involvement. And I got, I had just a moment to speak with Christine beforehand and she emphasized something as well, you know, about having that special care and compassion as well. And I think that's something that uh, we all as parents, uh, with a child, you know, of special needs, that sort of thing, we, we have that, but uh, it's always good to, to keep that as a focus as well. So, uh, without any further delay, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I never get applause. This is so nice. Everyone should be able to start off their job like that. Ellen DeGeneres said that one time. How great is it to come out to work and get, get, get applause like that? So thank you so much. Um, welcome to Florida. For those of you who are not from the state of Florida, from the Tampa Bay region, and as he mentioned, our organization serves on a nationwide level as well as a statewide. Um, we have many, many different federally funded programs, but for those of you interested in special needs trust, guardianship planning, or things like that, we have a program that serves the entire nation um, and is extremely affordable. As we know, obtaining attorneys and things like that is expensive. Our plans begin with $750, and even that can be laid away process for those that really find it difficult to afford that kind of program. I just wanted to throw that out there. We also have tons of information at the table in your exhibitor hall. And I'm going to go ahead and get started. So, you know, the little bit I know um, was already mentioned about my organization, but I just wanted to have these slides up here. We're not, a, we're not attorneys, but we do provide meaningful information and support. And I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into positive behavior supports. So can you guys all hear me okay? Excellent. All right, wonderful. Thank you. The guy all the way in the back told me, yes, good. I want to make sure, because I can't speak loud, but I think the microphone definitely helps and adds a little bit to the list. Um, positive behavior supports. How many of you are bus drivers? at the school level. I just want to kind of gauge my audience here. How many of you are, have ever worked in the cafeteria at this school? How many of you are part of faculty or staff at the school level or in community centers? Okay, that's good. Now I know the rest of you, the majority of you are parents or maybe even educators and professionals. You're supposed to be here. But in order for positive behavior supports to work across all levels, we need those other people in here too. We need the people across all community settings to understand how this process has worked, how it's developed, and how to make it work successfully for our kids. Because we're dealing with a lot of different behaviors, right? I mean, I know I am, I know all of you are. Uh, you, many of you are familiar with autism, and I've learned a bit about Bailey McDermott syndrome and I've come familiar with it having to come present here, and I know that there's a lot of similarities with difficulties in behaviors. You know, and so of course, and that's across the board, with dealing with all different types of disabilities. But behaviors are in every child, and in everybody. How many of you believe that we behave differently in different settings, all right? Yes, of course we do. You're gonna behave differently sitting here than you would at a cocktail lounge. I bet you're probably not gonna be as quiet, you know? So our behaviors are driven by our environments, by situations, and by things that happen. Triggers, that's what we're here to learn about, right? So we're taking a collaborative approach, which is why I started out by asking, what are the, who are the members of this audience? Who are you guys? Because those are the ones that are going to assist in that collaborative approach with building a positive behavior plan. How many of you 
actually have seen a PDS plan, a positive behavior supports plan? Anybody? Maybe just one? How many of you have ever had this discussion at the school level on a, what a positive behavior support plan is? <coughs> As a discussion, right? Okay. And it's important to know that you don't necessarily need to start that process with the school if they're not implementing it or across any other community settings that you're working with, daycare programs, things like that, you can implement it. And that's why I enclosed some of those forms inside your books. And if you don't have a book, if you weren't able to get one in your conference bag, I do have some folders back there with materials in them. Please feel free to take them, or all of them, or one of them. I don't want to take anything back. But there's a ton of forms there, and if you want them, there are some other strategies and help, and I, I did try to make sure that everybody had that. But this way you can become familiar with what an actual positive behavior support plan looks like. You know, it doesn't have to be filled out by a specialist, a therapist, a behavioral analyst. None of those things have to be, de this does not have to be developed by that particular person. You can write it yourself with your family, bring it to the school, and ask them to work with you collaboratively. Okay? So, and that's what we mean by a collaborative approach. Yes, ma'am? Is that the same as a behavioral plan, really? I mean, I've not heard of a positive behavior support plan, but our daughter's on a behavioral plan. So is that kind of the same type of thing? It is the same thing, but it depends on the context. Because okay. if it's a behavioral intervention plan, where you maybe have gone through the FBA process, the functional behavioral assessment, where you had a team of specialists come in to observe and make notes and write out a specific FBA, right? That's a little bit different. That's when the behaviors become more intensive. What we're looking at specifically with this training is preventative measures. We're looking to make sure that it doesn't escalate to that point where now we've got to have a team of specialists come on in. And this can be done at any level. This, this can be done at regular. Your child does not have to have an IEP to have a positive support plan, behavior support plan. That's the important message here. It can be developed anywhere by anyone who's familiar with your child. You know, so you don't need a team specialist, and that, that is a distinct difference. And we go into that a little bit further because it does get complicated between RTI, FBA, what to use, what are we using. Sometimes we're using everything, but it's not effective because we don't have the implementation. Part of the problem, a lot of issues with special education services is process. It's usually process. It's not that anybody doesn't know what we're supposed to do. It's the process from beginning to end you know, and understanding what those supports are supposed to be. So understanding patterns. Now we probably already know that there are some behaviors we kind of get an idea of what's causing them and why they're happening. But it goes deeper than that. We really have to observe across all settings because your child will exhibit different behaviors at the school level, at mom's, at your house. How many of us have ever heard, you know, our family members say, you know, she was fine until you got here. You know, <laughs> like, it's, like, what do you mean by that? All of a sudden, we're the bad guys. But it happens. My son with autism, I come home, I can't tell you how many times my husband was like, okay, I swear to you, he was great. You walked in and all of a sudden he got upset. Who knows what that was, you know? But it's about trying to figure it out. And that's what we're here to do. How do we figure this out together? How do we get there? Okay. So what does the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act say about positive behavior supports? It's something that can be implemented and included on the IEP. It is. It does not have to be something that requires specialists to be involved or anything like that. But you can bring your own positive behavior support plan and ask that it be included in the IEP as a part of different sets of strategies. Okay, now we already know how many, you guys, how many of you are familiar with IDEA and that federal law? Okay, that's a good show of hands. And for the, some of you who are not familiar with that, I do have another training today on the IEP services. And if you're interested in attending that, please feel free to attend that. Or if you still want to learn from me and there's something else you want to, you know, attend, which I totally understand, we are a free service. So if you ever want to contact me, learn something over a webinar session, you want me to host something with you, you want me to, you want to have some individual consultation with me, I'm more than welcome to do that, even if you're not from the state of Florida, I like you guys so much, okay? Related services, 
are services that the school provides in order to support your child's learning at the school level. This could be anything from transportation, could be anything from therapeutic services, physical, speech, occupational. And PBS can be written, positive behavior supports can be written as a related service on the IEP. So it can be written that way. You know, it's just a matter of being able to communicate that need. And remember, when you communicate something at the school level, do your best to make sure it's documented, recorded, written down. Yes, sir, you have a question? Yeah, the acronym IEP you're using, can you clarify that? I beg your pardon? You're saying the PBS plan could be supported on the IE, on the IEP, is that right? Yeah. I am so sorry. You know, and, you, and please stop me if I mention too many acronyms. In the disability world, we live in nothing but acronyms. The IEP is the Individualized Education Plan. And every child enrolled in the special education process at the school level has one. So if your child is eligible for special services like speech therapy, uh, behavioral therapy, occupational therapy, they would have an individualized education plan. Yes, ma'am. I think you just answered what I, uh, IDEA is. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act uh, is an act that's been, um, it's waiting to be reauthorized, which we know it will be. But you know, at the administrative level, we've got a ton of other stuff to deal with first. But this act is to make sure that all children have, are entitled to a free and appropriate public education. And it is the school's, public school's responsibility to ensure that that your child get educated alongside their peers without disabilities, that your child gets services, and help to assist them, because they're gonna need supports at the school level for them to learn, okay? But we go over that also in the IEP session, and if you don't wanna attend my IEP ses session, because there's something else, I totally get it. I'm a parent, I know how hard it is to go to these conferences and what to do, what to do. It's not the end here. My relationship with you doesn't have to end at this session. If you want to contact me, my information is on those folders, and I believe it's inside your program. You're more than welcome to contact me, and I'm more than welcome and available to help you remember that. Okay, so why do behaviors occur? Now, we know some of them already, right? We know that it's to get what they want. If a child wants something, they're going to act up. That could mean anything. We know that they're going to try to avoid homework, tasks, getting up in the morning, doing something that's considered undesirable to them. And that ranges from many, many different things, most of which, most likely as parents, you're already familiar with. What about medications? We never really think about the side effects that also can cause behaviors. Here's the big question too, and that's coming up. Are behaviors caused by the disability? But we'll answer that in a second. Medications, when you're dealing with having to give your child medicine, that's difficult too. Try to do it one at a time. I know that sometimes, especially with doctors, it's very hard to determine what behaviors are distinct. It's very difficult to distinguish behaviors that are happening because of undesired you know, activities or pain, especially if your child has difficulty with communication, with being able to communicate effectively. My son doesn't have effective communication abilities. You know, he says maybe one word here or there, repeats some phrases and words, but he will not be able, at this point, he's still not able to tell me if he's in pain, if he's struggling, if he's hungry, if he's thirsty. Maybe he doesn't want to eat what I made that night. You know, we're so, uh, we, sometimes we forget that, you know, our child may, some of us, not all of us, but some children aren't able to tell you you know, like a lot of other kids, I want chicken nuggets tonight, or I want, you know, I want pizza, or no, I don't want pot roast, I want, you know, or leftovers, I want something else. And it's really hard to be able to make those distinctions, um, unless you're using a form of communication or devices, pictures that enable that. And even then, sometimes, that's not always effective. You know, so we have to consider a lot of different things that our children are going through environmentally that can contribute to different behaviors. Sensory issues. If your child does have sensory issues with light, sound, touch, smells, that's a big one because that's oftentimes invisible. You know, you can't tell if there's a smell or something that's bothering them. How do they tell that to you effectively? What picture is there for that? You know, what about, what about uh, children that are just going through growing pains? My son is 12 years old. 
So he's dealing with a lot of the typical issues that 12-year-old boys go through. You know, that difficult direction in the morning that he can't control, that I've got to try and help teaching him on how to deal with that. Very delicate and sensitive issues. Or I know of other parents that have young girls that are going through PMS at 12 years old. Again, how do they express the inawkward, the awkward feelings that they're going through effectively? There's no picture for that. If you think about how much we use to try to get our children to communicate to us effectively, there's a lot of holes, right? A lot of stuff that people didn't think of or that's not available to us yet. And we, I can tell you as an organization, are working on things like that. Which incidentally, I have a sign-in sheet on the table back there, and if either of you are interested in continued communication with me and my organization, please feel free to sign up on that sheet or contact me directly and add me to ask, ask me to add me to your list, add you to my list, sir. I can't talk today. And I'll gladly do that and keep you updated on stuff that I've got because I'm working on uh, dealing with a lot of other issues that we've never really that people don't really think of because there's some topics that are taboo like some of those topics, right? But they're real issues for our kids. And we gotta figure out how to help them effectively with that. Okay? So sensory issues. How do we deal with that? What do we do with replacing some of those behaviors? And here it is, the million dollar question. Are the behaviors because of your child's disability? And the answer is always no. It is not because of your child's disability. Your child is not acting out because they have feeling and dormant syndrome. Your child is not acting out because they have autism, because they're this, because they're that. It is a function, it is a a, it's a symptom of what they're dealing with, and that's what it is. So if your child has sensory issues, those are a contributing factor to the behavior. Remember that the behavior could be caused by anything. If it's because of light, if it's because um, they're hungry, their inability to effectively communicate to you is a contributing factor to the behaviors they experience. It's important for us to know that. I am not canceling out the fact that, yes, having certain disabilities makes it difficult for us to function in ordinary life. Yes, it does. But those are not the main issues. So a person is exhibiting behaviors for different reasons. Frustration, desires, wanting to avoid something, wanting to get out of something, pain, hunger, <laughs> thirst. Those anybody can feel, with or without a disability. So I want us to keep track of and mindful that we're definitely, when we're starting to identify triggers, it goes deeper than what we think. We're not just looking at the symptoms of the disability. We are looking at the overall environmental factors that your child is dealing with. Do you know how many times I have gone into a classroom setting to help with developing positive behavior support plans? And the first thing I see, and I want you to think about this when your child is exhibiting an undesirable behavior, the first thing I see is, you know, walking into the classroom, I walk into the classroom, maybe the kid was, uh, I'll give you one specific story, he was a teenager, and he was throwing a chair across the room, he was angry, he was curt. Now the child does not have effective communication, but he was able to call this one teacher the B word, clear as day. <laughs> clear as day. One word he did say was clear. He was angry. When I looked around the, the setting, the environment. All I saw was everybody just sitting around taking notes. The faces were naturally annoyed, frustration, and anger. This is the environmental setting the child is already in. When we approach a situation with our children, when we're trying to modify a child's behavior, we have to modify our views on what behaviors are and how to handle them. That requires some, in, some insight into ourselves. How are we approaching our children when they're in that behavior? There are tail signs on their reaction. Don't underestimate your child. They have feelings and they see things. If you're angry with them, they're going to also react to that anger, to that approach. So, for example, even you know, talking like this to a kid, you know, what does that do sometimes? That provokes an attitude as well, as an immediate and instantaneous reaction. Our children are no different. If 
we approach children, you know, look at it this way. Any physical movement with palms down is a negative reinforcement. It's negative. You're definitely going to prompt a negative response. Palms up, now you're coming as a friend. You're approaching in a positive and different approach. You're taking another way on trying to connect with that child. So it's different. It's friendlier. It's more inviting. It's more welcoming. So what happens? Our children also react to our responses. And it's important for us to pay attention to that. Now, yes, our children have difficulty with communication, but our reactions to their behaviors is going to determine and is a big part of the outcome of how we handle the situation. So think about how we approach it. Now, going back to our friend in the classroom, of all the things that were going on in that classroom and nothing was settled and everybody was saying, we don't know what to do. And all I did was just approach him, palms up, can I help? Can I help? Are you? What can I do? That's all I said. I didn't say much. Try to keep it short. And the issue was, quite plainly, every day the same behaviors happened over and over and over again. And all it was was being led to outside where there's a big dump truck down the street making high pitching noises that he could hear clearly. And it was upsetting him. That was the trigger. But everybody in the classroom was looking around the classroom. They, we have to think deeper and search further than that when we're dealing with behaviors. You know, we have to think about what the environment and what the setting looks like. We know our children. A lot of times they're giving us signs about what's acceptable, what's preferred, and what's needed. And it's up to us to figure those things out and how do we do that. <clears throat> oh, going back to this. Oftentimes when we're dealing with behaviors, because none of us have time anymore to do anything, it seems, right? Ella DeGeneres said it best, I love her, she's my favorite, but she said it best when she said we all have TBD, too busy disorder, right? So we have, it's busy, because developing a plan like this takes a lot of work. Time is gonna be your biggest investment when you're trying to put together a positive, support, positive behavior supports plan. It takes research. It takes getting to know your kid in a different way paying attention to the environment, thinking about what, where they're at when this behavior occurs, especially for repetitive ones, ones that you see over and over and over again if they're at the same time, certain room, with a certain person. These are things we want to definitely be, be, um, pay attention to. And when we think about our reactive behaviors and short-term short results, that's when we behave spanking, for example. A lot of people believe this is the answer. It's not, in any case, but a lot of times it does yield immediate results for different kids. For children with disabilities, not so much, because they don't learn in traditional ways, in traditional methods. We have to think of different ways, because every child has a different learning style. They interpret information differently. That's important, too. And I'm not just talking about kinesthetic, audio, visual, and sensing feeling um, styles. I'm talking about how your child interprets information brain-wise. How many of you have ever seen the show Brain Games? Have you ever seen it? It's on the Discovery Channel. It's a really fun show. And it exhibit, and there's a one episode that shows you how behaviors can be changed. There was one show, it was a study. Uh, they had invited, and everybody was in on it at the office. You had the scientist, the doctor, um, uh, the front desk people, and a few other people that were in on this experiment, okay? You're invited to come and participate on a test for chili, hot sauce and chili. They ask you to come on in, and you're coming in, and you're getting paid to do this study, and you walk over, and the front desk lady says, yes, you're going to go into that office back there, and they'll tell you what to do. And as you're walking there, some guy bumps into you and says, walk much? and walks away and you're like, oh. you go and you sit down to take this test and the doctor comes in and he says, there's three bowls of chili here and there is a mirror that's two way, you can see out but no one can see in. And then you're asked, now the gentleman that's gonna come inside there, which who incidentally turned out to be the guy that bumped into you when you were walking on your way to the testing, sits down 
And the doctor says, now, he's going to have to try this chili, but I need you to decide whether or not you're going to give him the mild, medium, or super extra hot chili sauce. <laughs> and so, of course, which do you think most people picked? They picked that super hot chili sauce, because that guy bumped him earlier. Now, they did another study where they eliminated the bumping action. Right? They eliminated the guy bumping into you, and you come in, and what they saw was people were much more compassionate. They were using the mild chili sauce. Now here's where it gets an interesting twist. And here's a clear example of how behaviors can be modified. Same story. You go in, and you get bumped into. Only this time when you sit down, the doctor says, how was your day? I guess it was okay. And he says, would you like some water? Would you like maybe, you know, a diet soda? Would you like a Coke? Anything? Are you okay? Are you comfortable? Yeah, I am. Thanks a lot. Thanks for asking. Same question, same person that just bumped into them. And we saw a shift. They were actually doing the medium sauce instead of the extra hot. So, and for me, that was a clear-cut example of how behaviors can and, and will be modified. It's fascinating, but it's true. Every behavior can be changed and modified. It takes work, research, collaboration, because you're going to need, in order to have this set across all settings, it doesn't just work if you're only going to do it at home. You know, anywhere your child goes, these same things have to be, everyone involved with your child has to be on board. Everyone. And so, why are we using positive behavior supports? Because we don't ever want it to have to, our behaviors to escalate to the next level. We definitely don't ever want to have to go through a team of specialists and have to get there or develop a crisis plan. How many of you are familiar with crisis plans at the school level? One person. I've had to have one. My son got to the point a year and a half ago where he was attacking me, and it was really mostly just me. But I remember it was so difficult. It was the hardest thing for me to ever have to deal with. Um, I looked like, after dealing with my son, like somebody had trapped me in a closet with a bear or a cat. My arms were bruised. I had scratches up and down. Um, he was punching, kicking, hitting. And for the longest time, we couldn't figure out what the issue was and why. Because it was just random. We learned later it wasn't necessarily random. You know, he was going through physical pains. Um, how did we figure that out? Well, we learned that Richie, my son Richie, was actually dealing with serious headaches. And the only clue I had had to that was him holding his head and banging his head. And once I gave him a little bit of Tylenol and some other stuff, some other nurturing supports at the home level, because I was frustrated too, and I had learned to use negative reinforcement strategies that weren't very effective, and I'm going to go into that. Because what ended up happening was, all I did, and plus my reaction to his behavior, because I got defensive, I had to defend myself. You know, I got angry, frustrated. Before you knew it, we were both just round and round in a horrible circle of just violent activity. And it was, it was all for a long time. We had to develop a crisis plan. We had to have an MPA done. At that point, positive behavior, we were way past even utilizing positive behavior supports at that time. It took a great deal of research between myself, the, evaluate, the um, behavioral anal analysis specialists, and of other people to figure out how we were going to address these behaviors effectively. My son was placed in restraint and seclusion at least two to four times a day, every day, for four months. Not easy. It was not an easy situation. I can tell you that today, six months now, we are behavior, violent behavior free. My son is doing fantastic. He's at the school. We're with different teachers. It is a new school year, different setting, different classroom setting, which I think made some difference. But it's such a good feeling to get a phone call from them telling me how much they love my son. When as a year ago, they were actually asking me to take them home in the middle of the school day because there just wasn't any answers. And there's nothing that anybody was doing was working. 
But I don't take credit for that. That was a collaborative approach with me and the school and figuring out what the appropriate setting was for him and what strategies were in place at the classroom level. It took lots of research and work. It was an investment of everyone's time, teachers, myself, and our family learning how to approach Richie in a different way. We had to realize that when he came into the room, we acknowledge him even though he doesn't answer us. And that is any time. If he walks out of the room and comes back five minutes later, hi Richie, everybody is accustomed to doing that now. You know, it's just differentiating our habits so that we make our environment welcoming. Because, especially if we have kids that don't have effective communication, we have to compensate for that in some way. So when they come back into that room, hi, how are you? You okay? They're not going to answer you. Maybe they're not going to answer you. Maybe they're not going to say anything at all. But you acknowledge the presence, creating a welcoming and friendly atmosphere. Makes all the difference in the world. The Brain Games episode proves that. Makes all the difference in the world using positive energy in your household, sending out welcoming messages across all levels. It does a world of difference. So what are we doing? Now, if you look inside your pamphlets, you should have a PBS form. It's a plan, actual plan. And I do have loose ones in the back inside the folders over there if you're interested in having one. And those, and for those of you who may not have programs, there are some folders back there that I have some. I think we're out. Yeah, that's out. one. Yeah. Are we out? Yeah. If you want me to send you PBS plans, and because I'm a member of the PBS Association, I'm more than happy to send you a bunch of different strategies, a bunch of different types of documents. There's just too many to include in this pamphlet. They kind of limited me, but which they should. But I can send you a ton of more stuff. We've actually got a rubric we're working on that kind of tells you and the school whether or not you have a distinguished environmental setting for your child with, with, with implementing positive behavior supports or if you're a novice, you're just learning and starting out and how you get there, okay? So we've got some good stuff coming out and if you want, please let me know that you're interested in this information. I'd be happy to email it to you, send it to you whichever way you wish. But of course, we're gonna observe the behaviors, not just the behavior at that moment. Think about talking about what your environment looks like. We have a question. Yes. Do you have a website that we could go to and get some of this information? This information is not on the website, but I'll give you my website and you'll find me, my name on there, and you can click to my email a link. And that is www.fndusa.org. So it's FND, Frank Nancy David. USA.org. Thank you. Sure. And there's actually different forms on how to collect this type of data. I know I gave you uh, what I was allowed to give you these um, handouts, but I know that if you're interested in other information on how to fill these out uh, and what samples looks like, you know, sample of other plans or things like that, I'd be happy to do that. So we're observing our environments and what the behaviors exactly are. Collecting data means being able to document when the behavior occurs, how long it occurs, and what the intensity is. Intensity is, you know, from on a scale of one to ten, how bad is it? You know, are they, is it, is it just a behavior? If you're trying, it depends on the different types of behaviors you wish to curb. So it's only undesirable behaviors. If the behavior is a slap on the hand, that's not as intense as going across the room and maybe banging your head against the wall or biting or repeated kicking. So you're going to have to distinguish that intensity level from where it's something to the point of, well, this quickly passed within 10 seconds or the duration is now more than 10 minutes. And if that, something like that happens, then you want to make sure that you okay. address that immediately and figure out the preventative measures. But you want to measure the behavior. If you're observing a behavior, you need to know when it's occurring, how long, possibly what you think is triggering, because you're always going to be guessing. You don't necessarily always know the trigger, but sometimes we do if it's a loud noise. If it's maybe, sometimes it's really hard to detect this, but sometimes tags on the back of clothing on children aggravates them, causing different behaviors if it's uncomfortable. Even um, clothing 
types of types of clothing that they're experiencing, not wanting to do specific homework, tasks, getting up in the morning, all of these things are things that are observable and measurable. Developing your plan requires the use of those forms. You can use those, and actually there's other, a ton of other resources that are available to you as well on our website, but I keep it kind of a good head start where you have your ABC form that goes into collecting everything from start to finish, and then you have your other form, your actual PBS plan that goes into listing everyone that's close to your child. So if your child has a taken caregiver, if your child goes to school, things that you can work collaboratively from A to Z. Think about your child's entire day and who interacts with your children. Anyone else live with you in the house? Family members that you visit often. People that are often involved in your child's life. Those are the people that you want to work with collaboratively on building this plan. We try not to too much. Intervention is what you're using after you develop that plan. This is part of the process. And it's a learning process. And it's a long process. Because not all strategies are going to work for all children. So it's going to take some time to develop a plan that works for you. But that's what I meant by investment. It's going to take some time for you to figure out what works for you. Not everything works for everyone. I know that when my child was going through those horrible issues with behavior, and I had to deal with that, one of the things, and I found this out by accident, uh, one of the things I did was I had dropped his, his, he bumped into me, pushed me into his toy chest, and on there, there was these blocks, and they fell. And for him, whenever he's one of those children, he's very, um, his learning style is that everything has to be precise, neat, and in order in his room. And so, of course, those blocks on the, the floor distracted him from hitting me and attacking me. And he immediately got on the floor, started picking them up and putting them inside the bag. For me, I thought, this is a strategy, you know? So the next time he tried to attack me and was hitting me and spaying and, and, and kicking and screaming and fighting, I immediately would take out those blocks and start putting them on the floor. And of course, he immediately started to pick them up just long enough to get him into a calming mode. That worked for maybe, that worked for maybe, I don't know, I want to say a few days. It wasn't effective. And quite frankly, those were negative reinforcements. And we're going to go into that as well. But positive reinforcement is what we're talking about. But I need to give you an, an, an example of what negative reinforcements really are. Because they are both. The negative reinforcement is something when you take away or distract the person from the actual behavior. And what I was doing was not really effective, it wasn't positive. I was giving him another task to distract him from his undesirable behaviors. So that's not positive reinforcement. And certainly, that would never have been used at the school level. It's not something that I can tell the school teachers, hey, you know, how would that look? You know, drop a bunch of blocks on the floor and make the kid pick them up, someone else walking by would think, what are they doing to that child? You know, so that's not positive reinforcement. But I wanted to tell you that when you're a parent, you explore all these different options because at that moment, these are examples of shortcome strategies for trying to get immediate feed, immediate reaction, an immediate end to that behavior. And it's not always going to work. And that's why we have to explore and research and think of different things that can work. When you're developing a plan and you're using those forms that are inside your packet, you definitely want to get together with everyone involved with your child. So that includes your daycare giver. If at all possible, anyone that's transporting your child, that's difficult. That can, you can bring in at the school level. But remember I told you, if it's difficult to, in, if depending on your relationship with the school and at the IEP meeting, you definitely want to include your IEP members. If you don't have an IEP, or you're just working with schools, and you're a parent, I'm assuming that you're very involved, and you do work with the school level, then you want to definitely plan a meeting with your school, your educators, and across all settings if you have a child in daycare. These are the people that you're definitely going to want to include inside developing this plan. So those are the people you would mention in your plan and then review the data. That means going over what they've observed, what they've experienced with your child, what they've seen, the behaviors they've seen and been able to collect data that way and contribute to that. Research-based strategies are available at our website, online, and also in different packets and information. Research-based strategies are actually stuff that's evidence-based and that works, that has worked with other children. And remember, not all strategies will work for all children. 
But when they're research-based, you're of course going to look for the most effective, the most successful, and things that have worked in the past for dealing with things. There are definitely strategies out there that have worked with children. When we're thinking about what we're doing for, for example, for uh, children who are trying to avoid an activity. Well, you want to include something that is desirable to them. If you want to try, um, what I did one time when I was teaching my son, uh, using the picture exchange, using communication and, and using the picture exchange um, system. You've all heard of the picture exchange communication system with Board Maker. And I remember one of the things I did to help get him to start using the pictures was I had his favorite video of Monster Zing on the television. And I had pictures of different videos that he had liked. He loves Pixar movies. So with the pictures, I had only two choices to make it easy for him to learn how to use the system. I had Monsters Inc. and I had Nemo. And so when we had Monsters Inc. on the video, of course, hand over hand, I first gave him a few examples of how to give me that card by getting that desire, uh, by getting the television to turn on because I had it on pause. I had the movie on pause and asked him, and I shook, hand over hand showed him to give me the picture, and then I put the movie on as soon as he handed me that picture. So that was positive reinforcement of showing him on how to get the access to the watching that television show. So when I gave him the picture, of course, he put it on for a few minutes and tried that several times, but he understood once he handed that picture to me, he was going to be able to watch Monsters, Inc. So little examples like this on how to teach and modify behaviors or teaching different skills you know, can be utilized and implemented and included into your IEP plans. But I have other examples on that, but I know that I've got to go over the differences between RTI behavioral intervention plans and what they look like. How many of you have heard of response to intervention? <laughs> RTI? This is something that is probably um, maybe specific to Florida, I'm not, no actually it's not. It, it is actually implemented throughout all the states. But this was something that was implemented in 2005. It is a system that's used across all schools at the school level. So if your child is in the public education system and if they are in uh, uh, regular classroom settings, there is a universe, universal screening monitoring system that happens for all students. So basically, and di different states and different schools have different names. It could be the multi-tiered system approach um, or RTI. But what it is, is it's used at the universal level for children, that means any child, child without a disability or with a disability, is screened on whether how much they're learning during that grade year. So they're all screened at the beginning of the school year on whether or not they're keeping up with their fellow students. Some children who sometimes trail behind because of different learning styles, may need additional supports or help at the classroom level so that they can keep up with their classmates and graduate or pass to the next grade. If any child is noted through that screening process that they're falling a little bit behind, well then we move them up to tier two. And that's done by assessments done in the classroom by teachers, by educators, and by other people in the classroom settings. Then, tier two offers a set of different types of increased strategies specific to that child to help them with learning. Tier three is for if they're really, really starting to fall behind and run the risk of not being able to pass to the next level. Now that also pertains to academic and behavioral needs. So you have one side that, that talks about academic issues and then you have one side that goes into behavior. So they're talking about if your child is definitely exhibiting behaviors that interfere with learning, then they're going to be basically going up those tier levels based on the strategies used in the classroom system. And these are things that you can ask your teachers at what level of RTI is your child on, you know, a response to intervention. Then we have parent involvement. You are supposed to know what strategies are being used inside the classroom level for both behavior and academic. And it's important to know especially what strategies, and I always take that approach when I ask teachers, what strategies are being used at the classroom level? What are, you, what are you doing? What is being implemented? I try very careful not to ask questions like, what are you teaching my child, because that can be offensive. But I do ask what strategies are being used at that level of the behavioral, especially with regards to behavior. Oh, and it's not ESC. This is important. If you require, if, if, if any parent wants their child to be evaluated for 
and IEP or special education services. They are two very different services. They work parallel to one another, but one does not supplement the other. So if your child is receiving academic or behavioral strategies in the classroom setting for RTI, then they don't have to lose those services if they get into the special education process. And I think that's really important to know because a lot of times, sometimes services are supplemented for the other. Your child can be receiving services from both sides. A behavioral intervention plan is if your child is now exhibiting behaviors that exceed a need a little more assessment by specialists. At this point, we need to bring in, bring in a team of specialists to come in. And if some of you have already mentioned that you have a behavioral intervention plan in place, or you're, you're looking to get one. And if the behaviors in the classroom setting are not being solved by the strategies that your teachers are familiar with or only know that you bring in a team of specialists that are comprised of everyone that works with the child, uh, your behavioral anal analysis, and your behavioral specialists, and those teams are going to come in and do an evaluation and an assessment. They're going to start documenting um, the same things that you would be doing at home, but of course, they're using different assessment tools, and these are different, different behavioral assessment tools that vary from state to state. But they're going to develop a functional assessment of your child and would eventually, of course, convene as a meeting to just to re review <coughs> these things with you and go over what's going to be known as the functional behavioral assessment and ultimately develop with you a behavioral intervention plan. So this is very specific and it's different from the IEP. It's about a few pages long as well. It's much more intensive than your positive behavior support plan because now we're past that. We're moved on to much difficult behaviors. So the intervention, and when I mention hypothesis statement, it's because remember, we don't necessarily know exactly, pinpointing exactly why certain behaviors occur in different settings, but we're taking an educated guess. We're looking at this and we're thinking, this is what we think is causing these behaviors. These are the strategies and measures we're going to try to do to prevent the behaviors, and then this is what we're going to do after the behavior or during the behavior. So these are, this, that is all mentioned and decided in the plan, and together as a team, with your involvement as parents and educators. Modification, the team, your, your IEP team and your school and everyone involved with your child should get together annually or whenever necessary. Because if the behaviors continue and we don't see improvement in the child's behavior at the classroom setting, then we definitely want to reconvene and figure out why and go over that. Because then that means only one of two things has to happen. We have to either increase different services or change our strategies because whatever it is we're doing doesn't work. And when you have a plan in place, how long do you let that work, right? And how long do we definitely do that? Well, it's going to depend on the intensity, on the intensity, on the intensity and the, the type of behavior that's happening. So maybe we want to put in a plan like this in place for two weeks and see what happens. If before that, the behavior is just increasing and getting worse, then we definitely need to be before that. Because remember, we're looking at, especially if we're dealing with behaviors that interfere with your child's learning, or interfere with the learning of others, or if they're self-injurious, or if they're hurting other children. So with me and my son, for example, when we were dealing with the restraint and seclusion every single day, we were meeting quite frequently. So my son was being restrained physically, placed in seclusion at least twice a day, and two to four times a day. And this was several times during the week. After the first week, and we realized it was the exact same number of times he was placed in restraint and seclusion, then we had to get together and come back and meet again. And that next week, we come back and look at this again. Now, did we have to have the entire, I mean, it's difficult, I know, to get an entire team of specialists together again, but it's crucial. It's crucial, and that's something that can just be required by a written letter. You write a letter to your school, anything that's written, they have to respond if you have a little difficulty. But I'm a firm believer that I truly believe everyone in the school system most definitely wants your child to succeed. No one wants your child to fail. And certainly when dealing with d difficult behaviors, everyone wants to be able to help on that level when we're dealing with severe behaviors especially. So how can we change behaviors? We all believe that we can modify them. We've seen that they can be modified. The brain games example definitely shows us how behaviors can be changed. We talked about positive reinforcement, being able to um, encourage 
your child's good behaviors. How often, it's so easy for us to get by when we see our child doing something they're supposed to do, and we don't reward them enough for doing that, for behaving well. We want to be able to reward them for when they are behaving well. Acknowledge the good behaviors as well. You know, because sometimes, a lot of times, we'll go past that day and miss it because we take it for granted. Or, it's just a matter of, well, they're supposed to be behaving this way. This is what's expected. Well, when you're dealing with the flip side of difficult behaviors, you definitely want to show that distinction, that you're going to applause the good behavior, not just discipline the bad ones. You know, and that is huge. And I tell you, that's why I said, approach with my son, thinking about how what my approach was and being able to change, constantly acknowledging his presence, constantly acknowledging his good behavior and what he was doing, what he was supposed to be doing, it, whether it was sitting down calmly, whether it was um, listening attentively, whether it was, because he can follow single step commands. If I ask him to take his book bag upstairs to his room, and he did it on the first time, I mean, that was something to acknowledge. These are little things that I've learned to train myself quite honestly, because that wasn't easy either. Because I took it for granted. And being busy, because we all have TBD, it was hard for me to remember that all the time. And to be able to make, definitely reinforce those positive things. Because with that, then the change happens to them as well. Now they're starting to look at these things. And it's such a clear message. And it seems so mundane and simple, but I promise that works. Being able to definitely change your attitude on how you're dealing with your children on a positive way and to thinking about how your approach is. And with the negative reinforcement, then we're looking at, okay, well, the story of the blocks. That necessarily was not positive reinforcement. I was giving him yet another task to distract him from the other. Another example of negative reinforcement would be, say you have your child uh, is in the classroom and they're sensitive to high-pitched sounds and if another child is screaming in that classroom that possibly could cause behaviors you know especially if it's unpleasant and nobody likes to hear anybody scream but if your child has real high sensitivity to that now we may see a chair turning over them getting up wanting to escape the room and of course if a teacher has identified that okay he only cries whenever this other child is screaming in the classroom well, then negative reinforcement would be just to remove that screaming child from the classroom, but that's not the answer now, is it? You know, so this is where we have to distinguish the different types of conditioning behavior. How do we modify that behavior? How do we desensitize, bless you, your child from being able to listen to that child screaming? And yes, maybe, because that one's a tough one. If you're in a classroom with screaming children, then definitely we have to look at environmental settings because if we have a series of children that are, have great difficulty with sensory issues, then maybe that placement wasn't the right placement to begin with. Environment is crucial and important. My son can't be in a classroom where there's a great deal of distract, distraction on the walls. Even so many beautiful pictures, ABCs, colorful pictures, things like that, it's very distracting for him and his learning style. And so we've had to make it, and most children um, with autism and disability, learning disabilities like that also have difficulty with doing that, too many distractions. You know, so a lot of times in these classroom settings, the teachers already have figured out that they're going to remove some of those distractions to increase learning. But these are different, different types of strategies that are used across the classroom and in the different environments. When you go into your classroom setting, look, at, or when you go into the schools, Think about even the culture of the school, the culture of the people that are working around with your child, because if they all have that positive flow about them, then we can definitely see an increase in positive behavior. I know that different approaches, even with extinction, ignoring the behavior. How hard is that? That's really difficult, but believe it or not, it works. So if you have a child that's exhibiting uh, difficult behaviors in the classroom, and let's say the child just keeps asking you, calling your name, asking you for something that you know you're not going to do. Maybe it's candy. You know, you can say no and redirect them to something more positive, or switch that candy option to something else. If someone is just tapping their foot on the floor, and this is a behavior, it's not intensive, it's not violent, but you can ignore that. 
eventually it's going to stop. Little things like that is part of extinction. The behaviors that you could ignore, obviously you can't ignore biting, punching, kicking. Those are the ones that need immediate attention. Desensitation, desensitation is if a child is wearing clothing, let's say for example, a child is wearing clothing that bothers them. We mentioned that. There are different techniques that are used in behavior to help with dealing with different sensations. How many of you have heard of that brushing technique? You know, they use, right, some of those are used to help with children dealing with different sensory issues. There's also um, the uh, joint compressions. Have you guys ever heard of, heard of those from your OT specialist? Those have been used to help desensitize sensory issues at different levels. You know, so there's a bunch of different techniques that can be used. You know, when we're managing our plans, we reconvene at the IEP meeting and review our positive behavior plans, look them over, think about the people that are engaged and working with our children. What are their observations? What are the, t what are the things that they're seeing our child exhibits? Review the FBA, look at the assessments that are being taken at the school level and talk about them. And don't be afraid to ask questions because they're very difficult. Uh, a lot of times they'll use acronyms. It's, it's, it's difficult at the, at the school level. They're going to use acronyms. They're going to use jargon that we're not familiar with, words that we don't understand, tools, evaluation tools, and scores and assessments that we're not going to be uh, uh, familiar with. Don't be afraid to ask those questions about what you're definitely An FBA is a functional behavioral assessment. That's where your, team, your behavioral team is going to come in to discuss the results of your child's assessment process. Sometimes they reevaluate those and conduct tests every so often. Uh, they're constantly reviewing the strategies being used, the success rates of those strategies that are being used, and what else is happening. The behavioral <coughs> intervention plan, that's the plan that's in place at the school level um, whenever it's become too intensive and too crisis driven for you to use a PBS plan. A PBS plan, remember, is something that you want to use at the start of the year with your IEP meeting, just looking at preventative measures for behaviors that you've observed that you know. Because remember, we don't want it to escalate. We definitely want to be able to use them at that level. A crisis plan is something that everybody is on board with when behaviors have become way too intensive and what we agree with. Are we okay with this type of restraint or what type of activity or action is going to be taken. Look at where children are being placed if seclusion is something that's used at the school level. Look at what your disciplinary process at the school level is and discuss as a team what you feel is agreeable and appropriate you know, to be used during your crisis plan. Review goals and services. What's being used for behavioral therapy right now? How much therapy is being given? What are the strategies used during that process? And what are the target goals? Because what is the goal? Is the goal that we're going to decrease biting, you know, or hitting, you know, down to, let's say, if your child is doing it 12 times a day, we want to decrease it to at least five or six times a day. How do we do that? Two to six times a day, as opposed to 12 to 15. And what strategies are going to be in place after that? And who's going to be responsible for that and doing those things? And how much information are you going to get in between that time. So from the time that the plan was developed to the, when you're next going to meet can be discussed at that time. You know what, I'd really like the data to be sent to me within the next two weeks and see if this is working. Because remember, the behaviors exhibited at home and at school could be very different. You may not be seeing some things in a school might, and you want to be able to have that ongoing communication with your educators to learn about those behaviors. You should have a copy of all plans developed at school, whether it's an individualized education plan, behavioral intervention plan, and positive reports, behavior supports plan. And you should understand them. If you don't, then you definitely want to ask questions at those meetings and make sure that they are thorough in explaining the strategies, the assessment process, the technology used, Whatever is being used, especially with their disciplinary processes, I can't tell you how many parents, how many times I've spoken to parents who didn't know that their child was restrained in certain ways. You know, depending on how that practice is at your school or state. Then there's also um, how whether or not they do place your child in seclusion. You know, that is placing them into a room 
you know, for calming down. The purpose is to get the child to calm down, especially if they're attacking others or hurting themselves. You know, these different types of, of disciplinary actions are used at different schools, different states. Do they mean different things? It's important for you to know what that means at your school and in your state, because it's going to vary. State regulations and state requirements are going to vary from state to state. In Florida, you know, they're not allowed, you know, they have certain uh, times, you know, that you can place a child into seclusion. There's uh, the objective, of course, is to reduce restraint and seclusion overall in our state. But it's important for you to know what those policies look like at your school or in any other community setting that your child is involved in. You know, but these are the people that you definitely want involved. You want to know what the plans are. You want to know who's working with your child and what those services look like. When you're, when you're working with schools and looking at your PBS plans, update them often. Find out if things are working. If, you, if your child has met a goal on a positive behavior support plan or a behavioral intervention plan, look at them again and see if there's something else that we could also improve upon or address. Remember, behaviors are just about modifying. Modifying behaviors, improving behaviors, looking for desired behaviors. Thinking about how we want to change and do things even better, or learn, learning new behaviors, because we can learn new behaviors. Um, greeting people, politeness, all of those things can be incorporated into a positive behavior plan. It's not just about dealing with undesirable behaviors, it's about planning something of even the desirable ones. You know, how can we work to improve this behavior? Or how can we work to eliminate this behavior? But that's what the plan is supposed to be about. You know, does anyone have any questions? Here's the microphone. Hi. No, I have the microphone. So if oh. anybody needs to ask questions, point the mic. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I know there's different names in the case of uh, like for IPs, ID, all this for private schools. Because my daughter was in public school and she used all of these plans, but now in, in private school, how can we apply this? Well, your positive behavior support plan can certainly be applied on any level. That's something that all, you know, on a federal level, it is encouraged. In fact, I can send you an announcement that went out to all schools, you know, from the Department of Education. But your, your privatized schools are not required under the Individual uh, with Disabilities Education Act on some things, as you probably may have figured out already. You know, because they're private funded, so they're not federally funded, and because of that, there's certain things they're not required to do. But certainly private schools have adopted many same policies as public education, like the IEP process. They don't have to write an IEP, but they understand that this is needed for specialized, for individual learning. So they have used the same names and adopted the same things. But I can't see any school objecting to developing a plan on positive behavior supports because there's nothing invasive about it. You're looking at using your natural resources and just coming together basically as a team to modify the environment to help improve your child's behavior. Who would say no to that, really? You know, so I truly don't see that. And if you even came to them with this document, that's not a federal document. It's not listed. It's not given out by the Department of Education. So there's nothing threatening about it. You know, it's simply just a matter of we want to come together. We want to talk about these issues that we're dealing with. How do we solve them collectively as a team? You know, and that's really what it is all about. In a nutshell, being able to reach a solution and being able to strategize together on how to improve your child's behavior as a team. Yes, and of course, the teachers don't want to be hit or kicked and fit at school either, so it's to their benefit for that too, right? Absolutely, of course. The teachers are also looking for different solutions too. Um, I have lists of tons of different uh, strategies that have been submitted by different schools and teachers that are known as best practices and have been successful in different settings. There's so many different ones. I would love to be able to email all of those to you um, so that you can take a look at that. Because and again, please keep in mind, not all strategies will work for all children. And that's something we all know just by trial and error already in the past. But 
there's a lot of stuff that could possibly work for your child. You know, and it's just a matter of, again, research and investment of time. Everybody's time. This is a team effort. This is a, a PBS plan is not going to work if it's only implemented at home. So it has to be something that everybody's on board with. You're definitely going to want to talk to your teachers, whether they go to privatized or public school. You definitely want to go across with your therapist. Remember the people that service that are private contractors are coming in to work with your child as well. Anybody from your state services or anything like that coming in to provide therapeutic services to your child, you put them on that team as well because they're going to also be able to contribute valuable information that they've observed. Everybody, just as your information is vital, so is the information and observations of everyone else that's ever worked with your child. Does anyone else have any questions? So I didn't, I was just commenting on this. So, but I did want to say as a PMS parent, um, that this really works. Our daughter had behaviors that were escalating and escalating and last year she was hospitalized for eight weeks um, so that her behaviors could be observed. She was taken off all of her medications and put back on her medication slowly um, and that worked for a while but then as she got back into her classroom setting everything started to escalate again and we went through the whole process of bringing in behavioral analysts to observe her behaviors, look at her surroundings, you know, get an outside mm -hmm. view. She was hitting, um, she would have incidences of 90 times hitting in the classroom in a day, going after other children that were in wheelchairs and couldn't defend themselves. And, you know, we were kind of mortified that she was out there doing this and behaving like this. And they implemented a plan at school and her behaviors, they charted her behaviors every day. And we saw her behaviors go from 20 to 30 to 40 hits or bites or screeches a day down to three or four in a day. And we just saw this drop right off, and she's consistently for two or three months now just had minimal behaviors in her classroom. And we don't have a lot of those same behaviors at home, but when we do, or we feel as though she's escalating, we immediately put the same plan in place that they're doing at school, and she stops. And it's all about the positive reinforcement and catching her doing the right thing for a period of time and rewarding that. And it, it totally works for her. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And you had everybody involved in the plan. Yes. So her after school programs, her um, extended day program, her PCA, we do it, her school does it. Yeah, everyone knows the plan, everyone goes involved in the IEP meetings to set up that plan, and everyone does the same thing. And that's exactly what we have to start practicing because it's so easy for us to forget. I'm sorry, you were going to say something else? She just asked what kind of plan she's on. So what they did for her is they implemented a timer where she starts out at four minutes. She's worked away up to four minutes. I think they started at two. And she has basically a chart that says she needs to keep quiet hands or keep safe hands, keep safe body, and keep a quiet voice. So those are her three goals. The main thing was hitting, kicking, and screeching. And they set her on a timer, and two minutes goes by, and they say, okay, Emily, did you keep safe hands? Did you keep safe body? Did you have a quiet voice? Yes. She answers those questions. She gets the first letter of her name. So when she's able to spell out Emily, she then has earned a reward. And that reward can just be two minutes on the iPad, two minutes of reading, coloring, something that she likes to do that's also coincidentally educational for her. So they might let her play a game of learning on the iPad, and that works for her. Um, so she's now up to four minutes at a time, and all day long, now that's a process, right? So all day long, someone has a, on a timer for four minutes all day long. But she's in a special education classroom, and they're with her one-on-one -on -one a lot anyway, so everyone does that all day. Thank you for contributing that. So it takes a whole great deal of using, being able to work with everyone that's familiar with your child, your child's desires, right? And that's what they did. They incorporated your, their children's desires into the plan, and they developed a reward process. So think about, when you're thinking about developing your plans with your educators and with the people that you work with and those with work, that work with your child, these are the types of ideas that can come together and strategies, because they're all gonna be different, because they're all going to be based on your child's desires and their immediate, their individual behaviors and learning styles, because every child has a different line of learning style and preference to learning. That's going to be different too, and that's something to explore and learn about our children. 
when we increase, when we include that information in the development of the plans, it's crucial. So we know that we can use an incentive process in developing the positive behavior supports plan. So your child at the end of the day can look forward to receiving this for having done these wonderful behaviors throughout the day. So we're modifying increasing skills on positive behavior at the same time. Positive behavior supports aren't just about dealing, like I mentioned, with negative behaviors, but they're about improving and increasing and maintaining the positive behaviors that we've modified. And that's something that's important. And you said something else that was important too. You mentioned, and I wasn't sure if it was because you, you, you said you had to reinstate the, poly, the, the plan again at home and start over from scratch. There was a kind of lapse where you didn't have the plan in place after she got back. We never had to have a plan in place before she was hospitalized. Oh, okay. So her behavior just got so bad that she ended up having to be hospitalized. Um, so she had been doing okay, and then her behaviors just started to more hitting, more kicking. Um, so finally, it culminated at her punching me in the face, and wasn't used to that. And kind of dropped to the floor and said, "Yeah, this is kind of enough. I'm done with this." So we had put her in the hospital for. It was basically supposed to be initially for two to three weeks to take her off all of her medications, observe her behaviors, slowly introduce new meds. That was the first of her having these terrible behaviors. And she came out, she ended up being there eight weeks. She had a couple of different reactions to medicines and wasn't medically stable. Long story short, she came out, went back to school and kind of had a honeymoon period where she was just great and loved seeing everybody at school again. And then started becoming more out of her shell and hitting and escalating again. So as soon as she went back into school, we immediately asked to put, bring a behaviorist in and start because we felt like the medications only can do so much, and that if we didn't nip that in the bud, that it was going to just escalate again, she was going to be hospitalized again. So they were quick to react to bringing people in right away and try to start looking at her while she's being good and start following what precipitates behaviors before they get too far. So we only had the plan when she came out of the hospital. Started it in um, probably March or April, we had her formal plan in place. And by the end of the school year, she's an extended school year now, but she had indeed escalated by April just in time for us to get this plan in place, and we just immediately saw that drop off I talked about. So that was the first time she had the plan, but we saw immediate monitored results. And it was, they did such good tracking at her school, actually, that you know we saw these awful behaviors, and we saw the behavior plan come in, and she had a spike. Right. We were like, oh, that was a bad day. And they said, yeah, she had a new staff person that day someone she wasn't familiar with. So she was testing the boundaries of this new staff person. So now that her behaviors are on track, they're introducing new staff people because they don't want her to have those spikes when she's with someone new. So anyone in her classroom needs to be able to redirect her and keep her on her positive behavior. So they're making sure that they're switching out her staff quite frequently so that she doesn't get used to one person and start doing that. That she needs to be able to respond to anyone in her classroom. She's 14. She'll be 15 in October. Now, how long between the height of the behaviors to the decreased ones, the desired decreased ones? Within two weeks. You know, it took her a little while to kind of put together that this is this is how this works and this is how you work it. And that's going to vary, everyone. That's definitely going to vary. You can see some changes in behavior within a few days, within a few weeks. It may even take longer than that because, again, and I'm sure you know by your own experiences, that it's going to determine based on what strategies are in place, what's going to work, and what we need to change. And that takes time and investment. But thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Can you take one more question? Sure. Um, my daughter is two oh. <laughs> and a half, and um, in some ways she has very typical two and a half behavior. She does things that she wants to do, and she's all about it, and the things that she doesn't want to do, she just doesn't do it. Um, and we're finding when her speech therapist comes that most of the things that her speech therapist wants her to do, she doesn't want to participate in, and so she kind of hijacks our sessions. Um, and like I said, she's young, so I'm not sure if you can give me some tips or pointers about how we can encourage the um, undesired activities that she's supposed to be doing, rather than just letting her get away with what she wants to do. Well, you want to encourage the desired behavior. So when you're looking at, it's going to take a team effort. This only happens with your speech therapist because she's being asked to do something undesirable. It's not going to be OT, but it's most frequent. Well, because when you think about OT sessions and speech therapy sessions, what is it? 
is work. Is work is learning, is doing different um, exercises for being able to strengthen your skills. So maybe what we need to look at is what are your daughter's okay. favorite toys, things, uh, enjoyable things to do. At that age, you start listing her desirable activities the same way this family did. Then you start looking at ways on how you can weave that into the learning process at, this, at, this, at these levels. So, and that's going to take time for her to also learn against the, again, the concept of, okay, well, if I do this, then I get this. So we have to start working on a reward system for your daughter. Maybe it's a desired toy. Maybe it's food. You know, children do work for food. I don't mind it. He works for, fish, uh, for fishies. The goldfish, the goldfish, he works for all different types of things. But his, his desires were most visual stimulatory. So he enjoyed like TV shows or anything that glowed and lit up. So whenever I wanted him to behave or to do certain activities, then I would be able to give that to him. And I love their idea about having a timer in place. Maybe from the start, the therapist comes in from the time the timer is there, and we can make it, she's two and a half, so her attention span is gonna be a little bit shorter. So we start giving her different goals for her two-year-old, um, for her understanding. So maybe if she's behaving well every, let's say, you know, five minutes, or something like that, and that can be decided between the therapist on what's more appropriate for her, then maybe we can start setting little goal settings for her to be able to get through that entire session. Because to expect a two-year-old to behave from this time, and typically therapy sessions are what, half hour to an hour? Or an hour long? It's gonna be impossible to expect her to understand that in one hour, she's gonna get this. So we have to start with little goals, milestones, to get to that major one, and then build it up. And that we can use, what do you use as a communication effort strategies with your daughter? you're trying to reintroduce PEC system. So she has good um, receptive language, but not as expressive. So being able to, okay, so maybe even the use of uh, the picture exchange system, first and then um, uh, programs usually work well. Like first we're going to work on this, and then we're going to get this, those types of ideas. And if you guys ever uh, go to, um, do to learn, do the number two, and then learn.com, they have a bunch of fun pictures and stuff that attach all grade levels with teaching many, many different behaviors and activities and individual functional skills. But they have lots of fun ideas that are easy to print online, is due to learn, and something ideas that can be implemented exactly for increasing the desirable behaviors. And that's something similar to what that family had talked about is one of them, being able to set timings, because it's gonna have to be appropriate to your child's age and understanding. You don't want to have to tell them in half hour, you're going to, you know, one hour, you're going to get this. If they're that young and they have, and they're developing, and they're, they have cognitive developmental disabilities, that might be a little bit too much to expect. But if they can understand the smaller increments that, okay, in three minutes, this alarm is set for three minutes. Some of those alarms that have those red or uh, pictures that are easy to determine when it's easier to see that ending part, you know, when the time is going to be set. Those are also sold online and they're fantastic. I forget what they're called, but they're timers that are visually having a visual picture of how long that time is going to see, how long the child actually has. So they know that when all the red space is finished, then they're going to get that desired object or, or activity or movie or whatever it is because it's going to vary between, excuse me, between children. So identifying what your daughter's specific desires are and activities, whether it's playtime. That might mean having to cut into that therapeutic session and keep it short. It doesn't have to be more than a minute so that you're not intrusive on the time that you spent, that you paid for. So we know that that's key. But I think that your speech therapist would help. Also, sometimes walking away from an activity and coming back helps. Getting them to walk away from something and then being able to come back. You want to be able to do that. But first, then programs are really successful with kids, especially with undesired, you know, having to do with therapy. Um, and then being able to set desirable goals at each interval. So let's say for your child, five minutes every few minutes, and then you can start to extend that time too. You start off with five minutes, you're going to get a handful of goldfish, you know, to do this activity, and then move on to the next. Your speech therapist, I believe would also be willing to work with you on some of those things as well. 
You know, I, I would imagine that they're going to work with you on um, different strategies and develop a reward system with you uh, if they haven't done so already. Definitely develop a problem, you know, with teeth. Because you have, and sometimes using pictures to illustrate the design, the the, uh, the activity that they have to do. So let's say they have to attend speech therapy. You have a picture of that speech therapy session there, which is just the board maker talking, right? So you have that first this, and then then you know whatever the desired activity is, whether it's riding on the swing for two minutes, or you know you don't want to pull them away too long, especially when you're paying for services like this. So you want to vary the different um, activities you use. I know I'm out of time, right? Okay, so I'm sorry. But thank you, parents, for contributing and helping and sharing your stories. We appreciate it. Let's give her a hand.